Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second session of day three of Presenting the Medieval World, offered by UNM's Institute for Medieval Studies. I'm Tim Graham. I'm director of the Institute. I'd like once again to thank all those whose support has made it possible for us to offer this year's lecture series. And tonight, I'd like to name them all individually again. We've been given a wonderfully generous grant by the New Mexico Humanities Council. We continue to enjoy the support of our many donors, the Friends of Medieval Studies. And within UNM, we've been very fortunate to secure generous contributions from the Office of the Provost, the Office of the Vice President for Research, the Office of the Vice President for Student Affairs, the College of Arts and Sciences, the International Studies Institute and its European Studies Program, the Religious Studies Program, the Medieval Studies Student Association, and the Departments of Art, Earth and Planetary Sciences, English, History, Linguistics, Music, and Physics and Astronomy. Um, we really appreciate that support. We would not be able to do this every year without it. I particularly appreciate the support that I've had for many years from the College of Arts and Sciences, in particular uh, since Mark Peasney has been dean. And it's my pleasure, my privilege, to ask Dean Peasney to step forward and introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you very much. And I want to start by thanking everyone for coming this evening. People come to be a part of this from Princeton and Yale and Columbia and Harvard, mostly because they want the green chile. <laughs> but also because they recognize the excellence in scholarship and teaching that the Institute for Medieval Studies represents. This is an institute that is world renowned for outstanding scholarship, outstanding programs, and for bringing in larger crowds for talks about the medieval world than many of these scholars from very famous places see just about anywhere else. So the fact that you come out every year by the hundreds is part of what makes this such a special institute and such a special event every spring. So thank you very much. I'd like you to give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> and I also want to take a moment to, to thank Tim Graham, who has been just an amazing director of this institute for many years, who has done more uh, than any other, I hope there are no other directors of institutes here in the, <laughs> in the audience. But it's really amazing how much of his heart and soul he puts into this institute, into this event, every single year. He's one of the only directors that actually uh, reconciles his own P-card. That's how committed he is to making sure that everything is done right, that everything is in its place, that everything is organized perfectly so that when you come here, you will have extraordinary speakers extraordinary presentations, and be witness to some of the best scholarship in the world about the medieval world. And it's really Tim Graham who has made that possible. So please join me in a round of applause for Tim and his extraordinary leadership. <laughs> really, nobody else reconciles their own P cards. <laughs> And I think, I may, I may be mistaken, but I think that Tim once mentioned that the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is his favorite museum in the universe. Is that true, give or take? Yes. <laughs> and so I wasn't surprised that he was able to organize this series to have a talk about his favorite museum in the entire world. And 
I'm very privileged that uh, you asked me to uh, give the introductions this evening because uh, I've never had a chance to visit. But I imagine, uh, yes, shameful, <laughs> I know. But I imagine after this evening, I'll have no choice but to uh, get on a plane and, and go see what I've been missing all these years. And the person who will take us on the tour of this extraordinary museum is someone who has started uh, as a citizen of the United Kingdom, education in the United Kingdom, and has, uh, before coming to the United States, worked as a librarian or a curator at the British Library, the Victoria and Albert Museum, Cambridge University's Trinity College Library. And we are very happy to give her a safe haven from a hard Brexit. So <laughs> we're very happy that you're here and you're not there for the chaos that is to come any day now if it has not already engulfed the United Kingdom. And today she is, I'll try to make sure I leave out the article, because I'll have to read it, because I'll, I'll put the article in if I don't. <laughs> she is the Director of Scholarly and Public Programs at Harvard University's Houghton Library where she leads scholarly communications and public programming initiatives, including exhibitions, publications, and fellowships. And prior to that, she was the associate curator of the collection at the Isabella, Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And what that means is that she has been judged appropriately outstanding and responsible to be in charge of some of the most amazing collections in the world. And you don't get to be in that kind of position of responsibility unless you are recognized as one of the most outstanding people in your field. And so it is a great pleasure to introduce Anne-Marie Eze from the Houghton Library who will talk about Boston's Byzantine Madonna, Isabella Stewart Gardner and medieval art. Take it away. Hello, good evening everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Um, so first off, I'd like to start with a huge thank you to Professor Timothy Graham um, for inviting me to participate in this fantastic program. And also a huge thank you to the staff and students of the Medieval Studies and the English Department, also Philosophy Department here at the, um, at the University of New Mexico. I'd like to thank you all for your incredible hospitality. And I'd also like to thank the um, friends of the Medieval Studies who I've had the pleasure to meet and get to know in the last few days, including Barbara Wittemeyer over there, who got a little shout out um, the other day as well. So thank you all very much for your incredible hospitality. It's my first time in New Mexico, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, so just a quick show of hands. How many of you have been to the Gardner Museum already? Oh, wow, quite a few of you. That's fantastic. OK, that's great. So I think then you might agree with me that um, our first lecture was introduced as, as uh, described as working at the most beautiful museum in America, and I kind of flinched because, in my opinion, the gardener wins hands down. So I've included lots and lots of gorgeous photographs of the museum um, to prove my point, uh, to remind those of you who have already been there how fantastic and splendid an experience it is, and to entice those of you who haven't yet been there to... Um, to go along. So, I will begin now with my lecture. Directions for my funeral. Please have an oak coffin, not a black cloth casket. I want it long enough that inside the head is not jammed in, as so often happens. If violets are in season, I should like to have one long cross of them on my coffin. If not violet season, I should like to have white roses and white heather, both are Stuart and Scotch. With these words, Isabella Stuart Gardner made provisions for her wake and burial over a decade before she died in 1924, dictating in minute detail and at length just how she wished to be mourned and laid to rest. In doing so, in death as in life, 
she called the shots, literally and figuratively, figuratively leaving the building on her own terms. And ladies and gentlemen, what a building it was and continues to be. Fenway Court, as the museum was called during her lifetime, opened to the public in 1903 with a spectacular denouement after three years of bated breath and speculation in the local and national press about what the Boston celebrity, Mrs. Jack, as she was called, was up to out there in the Fens, which at the, at the time was on the outskirts of the city. Gardner constructed a four-storey, late medieval Venetian-style palace which has often been described as inverted, owing to its relatively plain outer walls, um, which contrasts sharply with its rich jewel, jewel box-like interior. I like to think of it as the architectural equivalent of a mullet. Business in the front, party in the back. <laughs> <laughs> At the heart of the museum is a central covered courtyard, which is home to several centuries of art, surrounded by a living, breathing um, work of art, which is a spectacular garden. And overlooking the courtyard are galleries installed with eclectic paintings. That's Sar um, John Singer Sargent's El Haleo on screen right now. Painting, sculpture, furniture, and architectural remains, decorative art objects, and textiles. And um, more acquired, more, all acquired by Gardner over decades during trips abroad with the aid of an international network of advisors, dealers, and friends. And these, they're all um, sympath sympathetically arranged by her to create an atmosphere and inviting environment, which is a Gesamtkunstwerk, or a total work of art, that suggests an old world private collection of great antiquity. On her death, Gardner bequeathed Fenway Court to the city of Boston for the education and enjoyment of the public forever, renaming it the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And her will specified that nothing would be changed in the galleries after her death, thus ensuring her vision remained in place. So the focus of my lecture this evening is the European medieval art at the museum. And Isabella Stewart Gardner, she was a trailblazer in collecting and displaying uh, medieval art in America. And from as early as the 1870s, and that's a good 20 to 30 years before her peers, and right through um, the end of the First World War era, Gardner acquired Romanesque sculpture and metalwork, Gothic stained glass, altarpieces, ecclesiastical furniture, service books, vestments. And as you will see, many of these items were the first of their kind to enter an American collection. She installed these pieces at Fenway Court in galleries styled as cloisters, chapels, and a shrine that both evoke their original liturgical function and accentuate their preciousness and beauty as works of art. Visitors to the museum, therefore, assume that Gardner was Catholic, and understandably so. She was, in fact, a Protestant. Raised an Episcopalian, she belonged to the Episcopal Church her entire life, and nevertheless, she was deeply drawn to and moved by aspects of the rituals and ceremonies of Roman Catholicism, as well as other religious faiths, including Buddhism and Hinduism. And these she encountered during her many travels around the world. This evening, I invite you to join me on a pilgrimage through the museum. We will visit together five sites of special significance to Gardner, crafted from sophisticated and powerful installations that embody the intersection of her visionary collecting of um, medieval devotional art and her own spirituality. And we're going to start on the first floor of the museum in the Spanish um, chapel and cloister. So if you've been to the museum, I would forgive you for not remembering this room. Um, it's tucked away, um, it's very small, it's, you can't go in there, so it's, you can, if you kind of blink, you can miss it. <laughs> um, so the Spanish chapel, it's enclosed behind a decorative wrought iron gate, as you can see here, which actually formerly um, formed part of a synagogue. Um, it's a, sm a small, solemn, commemorative alcove, and in it you can find an altar laid with textiles and other liturgical furnishings, um, a painting of the Virgin of Mercy, 
a 15th century Spanish alabaster tomb figure of a knight, and stained glass panels with various um, saintly figures and also coats of arms. So um, I started off my um, lecture with Gardner's directions for her funeral, and when she did pass away in July of 1924, as per her instructions, she was laid in a coffin placed just outside this Spanish chapel. Her um, coffin was draped in a purple pal. Uh, there were the white roses in heather because it was not violet season. And on the wall at her feet hung a late 15th century wooden crucifix from her collection. And on either side um, stood tall candelabras which burnt candles day and night. Um, there were prie dieu, these kind of kneeling um, stools that you sit on to give prayers. And there, nuns from an order of St. Anne, a Protestant convent in Boston, prayed throughout the day and night. Mass was also said each morning until her funeral four days later. And these, were, these prayers were said by um, monks of the Cowley Fathers. These were the fathers um, from the Society of John the Evangelist. And again, a Protestant um, uh, monastery in the Boston area, which Gardner had patronised and was very close to. Um, finally, on the morning of July 21st, a requiem was sung in this space, and afterwards her, um, her coffin was carried out by pallbearers shoulder high in the fashion of, of uh, royalty of a queen, and a service was held for her at her church, a high Anglican church in downtown Boston. And then she was buried um, in the Gardner family tomb in Mount Auburn Cemetery and laid to rest between her husband, Jack, who died um, about 25 years earlier, and also their son, uh, Jackie, who died as an infant, just not more than two years old. So just so you can get your bearings, the Spanish chapel is here, behind this wall, and that's the gate um, from, this, from the synagogue. And the coffin was laid here, and this door uh, it has a mirror. You can see Sergeant Hel Haleo in the reflection was draped um, with uh, cloth with the crucifix hanging from it. So that's where her coffin was laid, not inside the chapel itself. So, we're now going to talk about these two items which were above her, her coffin. So what you're looking at here are the first French Romanesque sculptures to be acquired by an American, and they're still considered the most important Romanesque sculptures in the United States. Um, they arrived, Gardner purchased them in 1916, um, and where they originally come from, France, um, from um, a, a village uh, called Partenay, which is in the southwest of the country. And they come from the upper facade of a church called Notre Dame de la Coudre. And um, this church, over the course of its history, had become secularized. Um, and so slowly over time, um, various monuments and possessions of the church had been kind of taken away. And so um, the statues that you're looking at, the, sorry, the reliefs, and these were originally um, from the facade, as I said, and the facade consisted of three registers. Only the lower one still survives um, in situ today. So um, on the right, you can see two figures. These are the elders of the apocalypse. And the middle register of the facade of the cathedral had a whole row of these figures. And these are just two of them. Others survive, for example, um, there, um, there are some in the Louvre Museum in Paris. The upper register of the church um, had various biblical scenes. And one of them included this um, Christ entering Jerusalem. Another biblical scene that we know was on the upper facade of the church was the Annunciation to the Shepherds. And this relief survives um, today also in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Um, so Gardner, in inquiring these works, she was really setting a kind of taste and a kind of um, understanding of what Romanesque sculpture was. And so these became kind of the poster boys, as it were, 
of a new kind of um, aesthetic appreciation. And so this kind of a severe beauty, these elongated pr proportions, these finely chiseled cheekbones and this incredibly um, subtle um, pleated drapery is what became to uh, form in the minds of Americans when they thought of artworks of this period. And that's all thanks to Mrs. Gardner. So I'm afraid that's not where the story ends. These um, figures became incredibly uh, notorious, um, both during her lifetime and then also in the decades shortly after her death. And I'll tell you why. It's something known as the Partenay scandal. So when Gardner um, made this acquisition and the, um, the reliefs um, arrived in the United States, it launched a frenzy of interest in the church. And so people started to scavenge for other um, relics or you know, um, sculpture that they could um, take away. And soon um, many um, examples flooded onto the market. Some of them were removed illegally and others were outright forgeries. Again, we're, and with Ray, we're <laughs> drifting into forgery um, area here. So in the midst of this kind of um, outrage that started to ensue because um, French pa um, cultural patrimony was leaving the country um, in very kind of um, um, highly publicized way, Gardner's own dealer from whom she had purchased these um, these reliefs, was implicated. And he's a man called Georges de Mott. And he was actually pursued in the um, Paris courts of law and asked to stand and, you know, stand trial. And one of his own um, sculptors actually um, testified against him, saying that he had been asked to forge um, outright um, reliefs or also to restore um, others. And um, before the affair could be resolved, this sculptor was found dead. A suspected suicide, but many people, including his widow, who then also went to testify in the court case, um, believed that he was murdered. And it gets even more bizarre than that, because not long afterwards, um, Georges de Motte was also killed in a hunting accident, killed, shot by his own friend. So what kind of friend is that, right? Um, Anyway, so in 1942, luckily after Gardner had been long gone by that point, um, a curator at the Met decided to look into this and he actually um, he, um, instigated a scientific analysis of all of these reliefs in the different collections by now. And he demonstrated that um, with regard to the reliefs at the Gardner Museum, the lower halves of the elders um, are indeed forgeries um, but luckily, the entire um, figure of Christ entering Jerusalem and the busts of the two elders of the Apocalypse are authentic 12th century sculpture um, from France. So now we'll move on to our next stop. So we're going to return to the cloister. And you might wonder why I'm um, pausing here. Well, as you can probably see here, and I'm going to show you another picture as well. Um, the courtyard is surrounded on three sides by a cloister. And with low vaulted ceilings, stone benches, and red brick Romanesque um, style, um, it really calls to mind a kind of quiet ambulatory in a monastery or a convent. Um, and it, it gives us kind of um, respite from the kind of um, riot of colour and action going on in the central courtyard. Um, the sculptures around the courtyard um, actually embedded into the walls. Um, many of them come from medieval European churches and monasteries and indeed um, palaces as well. Um, and so... Um, Isabella Stewart Gardner, she pioneered the incorporation of, go back so you can actually see what I mean. She um, pioneered the incorporation of antique objects as columns, capitals, windows, balconies into the fabric of a new building, thus creating a new type of American medievalist architecture. Um, at that point, there was already um, kind of neo-medieval um, buildings in the Boston area and other parts of the United States. Um, but what she did that was different and then 
copied not long after us by George Barnard, as we heard the other day in the lecture on the cloisters, is she incorporated these historical materials, also um, try to as, have used as many as authentic construction methods as possible um, to create a kind of suitable environment that helped evo um, evoke the past. Um, so by the time Gardner had decided to build um, this museum, um, she actually found herself in the position where she had this incredible art collection at home, then in um, the Beacon Hill, a very, still very nice neighbourhood in Boston. But she actually, to be able to build this building, she had to buy a quite <laughs> um, short um, time span um, architectural elements that had been dismantled from various buildings. So you can see, um, for example, oops, here... Um, these balconies that come from the Cadoro, a palace that's on the Grand Canal um, in Venice. And the workmen that she employed were actually Italian immigrants in the Boston community because she was hoping that by doing so she'd be able to kind of imbibe some of these kind of authentic um, Italian um, methods as well. And I should say that the architect that she hired for the um, to create this um, vision for her was a man called Willard Sears, and she hired him specifically because he was a huge fan, as she was, of John Ruskin's book, The Stones of Venice. And she literally brought the Stones of Venice to Boston and created this kind of Venetian-style um, palace um, there to house her art collection. So returning to the cloisters... I'm going to mention this work now, which I know Marion is very keen to hear about. Um, go a little bit closer. So, and um, what we're looking at here is a retable with scenes of the passion of Christ. So you can see, um, for example, here, the kiss of Judas, the flagellation, the, um, cruci um, the crucifixion. Um, you can see also the deposition, the Mary's at the tomb. And on um, either side, you have um, kneeling uh, figures of donors with their patron saints. And we're very fortunate to actually know who they are. They're a husband and wife, um, and their name was Guillaume and Goudelette um, Bouvenot. And um, this, um, um, we know that because a, a very similar... Um, uh, Retable was found in a church, is still in situ in a church in France where they were from, uh, Saint Etienne in, uh, near Vignory. And also, there's another a work that they commissioned that has their coat of arms on it as well. So that's how, um, both on stylistic terms and also in terms of um, provenance, people are able to figure out who these people are. Um, it's very interesting that you know that it was, um, it was created around 1425. <laughs> And they had a son who actually died in 1424, and I wonder whether this work was commissioned in commemoration um, for their son. Um, and Gardner, she purchased this um, in 1897, so again, fairly early on in the history of collecting of this type of material in the United States, from a dealer in Paris called Emile um, Père. And he's quite an important figure in creating a market for these types of works, um, because he um, was prolific dealer and so many of the medieval collections for example in the Victorian Albert Museum and indeed elsewhere in the Gardner Museum come from his um, shop and furthermore when he died he actually left 4,000 works to the Museum of Decorative Arts in Paris as well as um, almost a million francs to them as well so he had a huge impact um, on collecting of this material in this period. Okay, so uh, I promise we're going on a pilgrimage, and we've, we, now we're going to leave the first floor and go to the second. So the first room that you encounter on the second floor of the museum is the early Italian room. And um, this room um, takes its name from the um, Italian Gothic and Renaissance paintings, many of them gold ground paintings, um, which line its walls. Better look there. And um, so Gardner, she loved Italy. It's the country that exerted the most um, impression on her, as you can see from her choice of architecture for the, for the, um, for the museum. And 
over time, her Italian um, art collection grew. And so when the museum first opened in 1903, this room was actually dedicated to artworks, religious artworks from different cultures. It had many Asian art objects in there, for example. But as her collection grew, she decided to focus it on Italian uh, religious art. Um, so in this room, there's a very interesting um, installation. And it's one of at least three sites of memoria in the museum. And that means it's an installation that was made to commemorate someone who had died. And we're going to have a look, closer look at this area here. So this work, which depicts um, St. Elizabeth of Hungary, and is uh, a fragment from an altarpiece, it was a gift to Isabella Stuart Gardner in um, 1917 from the essayist and poet and Harvard University professor um, John J. Chapman and his wife. They had just lost their son the year before, Victor Chapman. As you can see, he was only 26 years old when he died. He was actually the first US airman to die in the, sec in the First World War. Um, he had enlisted. And um, after a while, he was trained to be a fighter pilot. His plane was shot down, and his body was never recovered. It's a really sad story. And so his um, parents, visiting the museum uh, the following year, they decided to give this gift to Gardner, and she created this incredible um, 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 monument, as it were, to this fallen um, soldier. And so what she did is she placed um, the, the little pinnacle with St. Elizabeth on a chasuble. And this is when it, one of many um, religious um, vestments that you'll find in different parts of the museum, and you'll see more as we go along. And, um, and she placed it on an easel in front of another painting. And um, originally there was a, a wreath around it and also a card that read in, vit in memory of Victor Chapman. I think it's a very um, poignant um, installation there. So this is just to the side. So um, the piece that we just looked at is literally here and this is the wall that's just adjacent to it. And so on our pilgrimage, I'm hoping to show you these sites of importance to her, but also to show you highlights from the collection as well. And this is definitely considered one of the most important um, paintings in the museum if, and also in the United States. So this is the only complete altarpiece by Simone Martini outside of Italy. And it's the only um, example of the artist's work commissioned by the Order of the Servites of Mary in the Italian uh, city of Orvieto. So it's a very important um, work. And it's funny, in the history of the um, museum, we're very fortunate to have a, a complete archive where all of Gardner's receipts, her correspondence with her dealers and advisors are there. And this is one of the pieces which was considered early on in the, life, in the museum's history to be a kind of a great bargain because she purchased it for just £500. Pounds. Um, and she bought it from uh, Bernard Berenson. He was um, a young art historian, grew up in the Boston area, actually in quite a... Um, impoverished family. He showed incredible talent for art history and a group of uh, Boston uh, Brahmins, including the gardeners, got together to fund money for him to go to uh, Italy. Several years later, he became an extremely influential Italian um, art historian, um, writing many important works on, on Italian Renaissance painting. And he, he and Gardner rekindled their relationship. And it was him who helped her to build many of the, um, the artworks that are in the collection. And it's wonderful reading their correspondence and when he kind of tantalizes her with all of these um, items which are coming onto the market for the first time. And so I can read you a little bit from his letter that he sent with regard to this painting. And he says, um, I wish you to acquire for a mere song <laughs> a, a rare and radiant masterpiece by one of the rarest and greatest masters. A lot of um, superlative language here. Um, and he, they, they actually corresponded via um, uh, telegram. And so after explaining to her why it was so important, telling her to read his book and, um, and what he'd written about Simone, he said, if you want it, please cable. And then he put Y-E-S-I-M-O-N-E. -E. And that was their code for yes, 
Simone is one word. And they, they did that a lot in their correspondence because she was worried that someone would kind of um, understand um, <laughs> what she was buying and kind of get there um, before her. And here's a close-up view of this painting. It's absolutely stunning. So you have um, the Virgin and Mary at the centre, um, St. Paul, St. Lucy, St. Catherine, and St. John the Baptist there, with Christ um, revealing his wounds at the pinnacle on the top. Okay. So we're now going up to the third floor of the museum, and I'll take you to the Long Gallery and the chapel. And I'm going to show you this old photograph um, from the um, 20s, so you actually get a sense of what I mean when I say the long chapel, the long gallery, because it really is, it takes up one whole side of the building, and it has this incredible vista with a stained glass window at the end. But actually, very few people would have seen this view um, in Gardner's lifetime, and that's because um, the chapel at the end, where the stained glass window is located, was actually private, and that wasn't open until after her death, and I'll tell you why in a few moments. And so during her lifetime, as you walked up um, the, um, the long gallery, at the very end, you would come across this case called the Dante case, and then can you see this upholstered screen? That's actually a folding screen, and it went the entire width of the gallery across, so you couldn't go to the altar and the area with the stained glass window behind it. So the Dante case, why is it named such? It's named such because um, Gardner, um, even before she started collecting art, she was very interested in uh, literature, medieval literature. And she, she joined what was known as the Dante Society or the Dante Club. If any of you have read the book, um, yeah, the Dante Club, it's kind of like a fictionalised um, kind of murder mystery version, but it's done in a really intelligent way. Although Gardner is not mentioned there at all. It makes it sound as if um, only men were members of the club, and that's not actually true. So Gardner became a member of the Dante Club um, because she was friends with um, Harvard's first professor of art history, a man called um, Charles Eliot Norton. And she would attend readings of Dante at, um, at, and his art history classes at the university. And then she became a member of this club um, with other important uh, local figures, including the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And they would meet at Longfellow's home and, and read from the text. And so um, it's called the Dante case because Dante um, Gardner actually pulled together an incredible collection of books, um, copies of the Divine Comedy, both manuscript um, books and also early printed ones as well. And many of them lived in this case alongside other volumes. I'm not going to show you those because I wanted to focus on something else, which is a bit more on theme with what we're talking about this evening. So I'm going to show you one of the manuscripts inside that case. Yes, it's, it's quite spectacular. And this photograph is quite an old one, so it doesn't really do it justice. I'm a bit obsessed with this manuscript, so I'm going to try and keep it short, because there's still much more that I want to show you. Um, so this manuscript is a, uh, it's Venetian. Um, the date range, you'll notice, is pretty strange, 1504 to 1799. And that's for a reason, because this book was in continuous use and was added to over the centuries. And that's why I find it so fascinating. But what you're looking at here is the opening of the book, and this is dates from the early 16th century. So it's a statute book that belonged to a lay fraternity. And um, so in Venice in this period, and actually from much earlier on, um, there, were, there were fraternities um, who were based in churches and they uh, carried out uh, charitable works um, for their community, and they, you know, kind of looked after each other, and they, they, they were kind of, um, kind of, in place of what we have today, as kind of social uh, services, um, but they were made of lay figures. But they had to be sponsored by a church, and this um, confraternity, which was dedicated to the, um, the Holy Sacrament, was in a very interesting church, and it's another reason I'm kind of obsessed with this manuscript. Um, so it was in the church of San Gimignano. And if any of you are familiar with Venice, you might scratch your heads and think, which church is that? I can't picture it. And that's because the church was demolished. 
So this church was actually in St. Mark's Square. It stood opposite St. Mark's Square for a thousand years. It predated the Basilica of St. Mark, St. Marco by 200 years. It dates from the sixth century. And that's all until Napoleon came along. So as you may already know, um, Venice was one of the longest standing republics. Um, it had survived for over a thousand years until Napoleon shows up with the French troops. They come in and they take over. And what does he want? Well, St. Mark's Square, which he thought of as kind of the grandest, um, what should he call it, the grandest um, uh, plaza, let's say, um, in Europe. He wanted his palace his, to overlook it. So what he did is he demolished the church of San Gimignano to make um, space for a um, monumental staircase and also a ballroom. So that church does not exist. And it's a real travesty because it was a very ancient church. And during the Renaissance, it was actually refashioned by the important Renaissance um, architect, Jacopo Sansovino. And it was considered a pearl among rubies. It was a very beautiful church. And so this manuscript, which survives at the garden, is actually one of the few items that survives from um, this church and can be identified with it. And it's fascinating because, as I said, it was used over centuries. And so inside, it lists the statutes or the confraternity's laws, um, but it also lists um, the members, their professions, their ages. Um, it lists um, their possessions, including referencing this manuscript itself. Um, and it also um, has all sorts of strange and wonderful things. And sometimes the handwriting gets really hard to read, but one of the things that struck me was they're always talking about candles and, and kind of restricting the use of candles. And um, a couple of years ago, a group of scholars got together to make a kind of 3D rendering of the church based on various sources that survive um, as to its architecture. And one of the things that we realized in doing this is that it was actually very small, had very few windows and would have been extremely dark inside. And candles are really expensive, but I can imagine members of the congregation and also of the confraternity like constantly wanting to burn candles so they could see, but then being told, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> They're really expensive, we can't afford that. So it was really interesting like merging the documentary history with also what we understand of the, um, of the uses of the church in this period. And the Gardner manuscript is a kind of unique testimony to, to this, which has really been rather understudied. I didn't tell you what you're looking at, and I apologize. So what you can see here is the members of the confraternity, and they're all kneeling, and they're wearing different robes that signify their role within the confraternity. And the priest of the Church of San Gimignano, who we actually know quite a lot about, um, he's standing there, and before them is a vision of the Eucharist of Christ, and it's a very specific one that's popular in Venice. So you might look at this and think, oh, it's the Man of Sor Sorrows, but it's actually what they call in Venice the Cristo in Cain, or Christ emerging from a chalice. And so you can see him here supported by angels um, with um, his wounds um, bleeding. And then oh, here you have God the Father, and down here, San Gimignano, um, who was the patron saint of the church. So we're kind of going back a little bit because I want to show you also this item oops, here. So... This is a French mid-12th century crucifix. And I'm showing it to you because this is the first complete, and by that I mean it has both its original cross and the body of Christ together. These things often got separated over the course of history. This is the first complete bronze Romanesque crucifix to enter an American museum. And crucifixes really were not fashionable at, at the time. Um, it's not until um, J.P. Morgan about um, 20 years afterwards, who forms quite a large collection of crucifixes. So really, Gardner was ahead of the game again. And um, the remarkable thing about this, as I said, it's, it's complete. And so I'm going to show you so, the back as well. And you can see that it's pin 
is attached to it still. And this is because this cross would have originally been um, affixed to an altar so that the congregants could worship it and focus their prayer on the, su the suffered um, body of Christ. And again, it's extremely rare to find these um, intact. And Gardner, she certainly had a good eye for incredible items. And she, so she acquired this. We're not quite sure when, because I said earlier on that her archive is incredibly detailed, and there are many cru crucifixes in the, in the museum, and it's difficult to tell exactly which one this is, because they don't have very many identifying um, details in the archive. So she could have purchased this probably in 1897, but really almost um, as early as 1884, which is incredibly um, early. Okay, so we're going to go back to the marvellous stained glass window which you saw um, earlier on, and as I said, which wasn't really visible to visitors um, before Gardner's death in 1924 because it was behind the screen, which I actually kind of like to think of as a kind of rude screen. Now you're have, seeing it closer up, you can also see the incredible installation that she created here. Um, so there's an, um, an altar um, that's actually covered by a crocheted um, altar cloth that she created herself. Um, it has candelabra on it, a beautiful ivory crucifix. You can't see that um, here, I'm afraid. And it's also surrounded by choir stools, uh, which were salvaged from a church in northern Italy. So an incredible kind of confection. And the window itself, and I've just panned out a bit so you can see the incredible kaleidoscope of colours that it casts on the floor um, in the gallery when the light, uh, you know, the sun shines through there. Um, it's very important. It's, 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 we know where, exactly where it's from. It's from the Cathedral of Soissons in France. Um, it's 12th century um, um, stained glass. Um, other fragments of it survive in the, again, in the Louvre Museum. You're beginning to see a pattern here, but also to think, understand some of the quality of Gardner's collection if the kind of parallel pieces are in such important museums elsewhere in the world. Um, and um, this one, she actually bought in 1897, so incredibly early. And again, if you can just imagine, like, shipping something like this from, at this point, it was actually had ended up in Italy um, to the United States. It's incredible that it arrived in one piece. It's not actually the entire uh, window. It's about 90%, I think, no, sorry, 80% of it. The other 20% is in, in the Louvre, but it looks almost seamless, so I think it's one piece. Um, and it shows, um, maybe I'll go back so you can see a bit um, better. It's, it's based on um, the life of the first um, Bishop of France, and one of the most beautiful scenes here, and I think, sorry, it's quite difficult to see here, is that his burial is depicted here with all of the mourners uh, leaning um, over it. And it kind of also makes me think about Gardner's wake um, in the chapel at the beginning of this lecture that I talked about. Um, so, why was this space not of it. Actually, sorry, I'm missing one very important point. So during this, this is a consecrated altar. And I don't know of any other examples of museums that have con consecrated altars in them. If you know, please shout out, because I'd be really interested to hear of others. And so Gardner, when she moved to um, Fenway Court, so the museum, she actually lived in the building on the fourth floor. It meant that, as I said, she was now on the outskirts of the city. And so her church was actually in downtown Boston, which was quite a distance away. And so she created various spaces within the museum and where she could worship, and this was one of them. And so she held Christmas masses here. She would actually dress a costume as Mary, Queen of Scots, because she believed to be descended from the Stuart dynasty. And she would bring in um, the Cowley fathers, um, who I mentioned at the beginning, um, to, um, to lead a mass here in the chapel. Um, and in her will, and again, <laughs> she left very detailed instructions, she um, stipulated that every year a, a requiem mass must be held in her honour in the chapel on her birthday, which is April 14th. So it's just around the corner. If any of you are seriously thinking about getting to the museum, I would go on that day. It's quite a spectacle. And so um, we fill the um, long gallery with chairs, and you can see this uh, requiem mass being um, celebrated in her name in that space. It's really quite an incredible um, spectacle. So why was this space closed off to the public? 
well, A, because it was a consecrated altar and, um, and a place of significance that she used for worship, but also because um, just off view here is a door that goes to another room which could not be visible to the public during her lifetime. And that's where we're going to go next. So we're going to the Gothic room next, which is also on the third floor and just around the corner um, from the room we were just at. So in Isabella Stewart Gardner's day, the Dante case in the long gallery was the kind of the end of the road. Then you'd have to turn back on yourself to leave the museum. If you were curious, you could turn back on yourself and kind of go in a loop and what, you would be confronted with a uh, chancel screen um, in wrought iron, and you could kind of glimpse through there and see a painting. And this is the reason why the Gothic room was, um, as it's called, was not open to the public, because um, this painting caused a lot of scandal, and her husband begged her not to make it open, uh, visible to the public during his lifetime. And then after he died in 1898, she decided for it not to be um, visible to the public in her lifetime. And so it wasn't until the 1920s after her death that you could walk the whole way round the third floor and actually enter the room um, itself. So before, this was a kind of tantalising glimpse that you would get. So this is the painting that they were trying to hide or keep out of view. And what's so scandalous about it? Well, I'll describe it for you and... and and um, tell you a little bit why it was different from anything else that anyone in Boston had certainly seen at this point. So the artist is John Singer Sargent. Nowadays, he's a renowned name. In this period, um, he's, even though he was American, he was actually born, in, in, born and died in Europe. Um, he actually wasn't very renowned in the United States. He'd been practicing as an artist in um, Paris and had caused scandal because of his famous painting of Madame X. Are you familiar with this painting? It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And I can see a lady who's uh, nodding her head there. You can see some similarities in terms of they're both um, women are dressed in black, um, accentuating their figures and décolleté. And they have this gorgeous, sinuous, long arms. In the painting um, in the Metropolitan Museum, Madame X is standing at a table with one of her arms kind of placed um, behind her in this almost impossible pose. So that painting, which was displayed at the Salon in Paris, caused an uproar in France because of the way that, um, of how revealing her costume was and also um, the pallor of her skin. Madame X was a famous Parisian beauty and she powdered her skin and Sargent really played that up in the painting and her skin almost looks blue. She almost looks like a corpse. That was one of the criticisms that were said in the press at the day. It caused such a huge uproar that he actually fled um, France. Um, but before he did, Gardner went to see this painting. She wasn't scared by something like that. In fact, she actually loved it. And she asked her good friend, Whistler, to introduce them. I would have loved to have been a fly on that wall. So Gardner, Whistler, and were in Sargent's studio and saw the painting of Madame X, which had been returned to the artist. And I can just imagine Gardner saying, I want one just like that. <laughs> And so when Sargent came to the United States, because he needed, you know, an income, he, he came in search of new patrons, Gardner kind of took her, him into her embrace. And together they, they created this incredible painting. And so she is depicted very frontally, right? She's just addressing you um, face on. Her, her mouth, and I'll show you a close-up in a moment, um, is, is, is slightly um, open. Um, She's not taking any prisoners. <laughs> She's dressed completely in black. And what you can't see in reproductions of the painting, but you can if you see it up close, is she actually has a black shawl wrapped around her waist, which accentuates her hourglass figure. She has incredible strings of pearls wrapped not only around her neck, but also around her waist. And from the pearls are hanging rubies. She also has rubies on her shoes, which are difficult to see in reproductions of the painting. And her skin, and Gardner, she wasn't considered a beauty, but she was considered to have a very fine figure and, and gorgeous skin. And, and it's really, um, the artist is really playing it up here in putting her in a black dress. You can see her kind of pale skin gleaming out. But, um, so at this period, women were depicted much more demurely. 
um, never fully frontal, um, full-length portrait. So it was really quite um, outrageous and unusual a painting. Um, but what really got people talking was the, um, the um, pattern behind her head. So what Sargent essentially did, um, and I'm sure they conspired together to do this, um, they took a piece of Renaissance um, velvet that's actually in the Long Gallery, and he essentially blew up the motif and the circular kind of arabesque motif. And so as it appears behind her head, it looks like a halo. And this is what caused uproar because people said, who does she think she is? She's presenting herself like a Byzantine Madonna. That's something that Henry James called her. She was described as woman, an enigma, the American idol. idol. People just didn't know what to make of it. They hadn't seen anything like it before. It was talked very much about in the press. And as I said, her husband got really, really upset by all of the attention to the painting, both positive and negative. And that's why he begged her never to show it again in public and why that room wasn't open um, to, um, to, vis to viewers. So what did you see once you were permitted to the room? So now when you visit the museum, this is the last room that you visit and you enter through a, a portal and there she is in the corner looking at you. It's, it's, quite, it's quite unnerving as it is. And that's why I really thought of this as a pilgrimage because as you make your way and you end up there, you realise that you're in a shrine, essentially dedicated to uh, the founder of the museum. There aren't many um, likenesses of her in the galleries and those that are are much smaller, much more discreet and it's easy to miss them. But there's no way that you can miss this one. It's just there. And it has this kind of lifelike presence to it, which is really quite astounding. And I think some of this presence comes from clearly the way she's installed it, but also the way that light plays in that room. And so you can see embedded into the fabric of the um, building is um, a 12th uh, yeah, century uh, wheel window from an Italian church. We don't know, unfortunately, which one. And also, again, Gothic arch windows. And there's, so the light kind of streams in, sometimes also through the stained glass window. And there are all of these um, gilded objects in there, including the frame of the painting itself, and it creates this kind of otherworldly presence and kind of luminescence in the room. It's really, these pictures are great, but it, you have to experience it for its, your, itself to really appreciate it. So in the Gothic room, and this is where you'll find many of Gardner's um, medieval art objects, and she's displayed them on tables, on uh, various furniture, um, this little setup here that I'm going to return to in a few minutes as well. So again, some of the kind of installation practices that we've seen elsewhere on our um, pilgrimage, you can, they really come to the fore in this room. It's not a period room, but it's one of the few spaces in the museum where most of the objects come from more or less the same period. Although, that said, um, a lot of the furniture is later on kind of, um, kind of um, neo-medieval um, style furniture. So again, an old photograph. In the archive of the museum, there's an incredible cache of old photographs. Gardner changed the, the galleries, and so she had a, a team of photographers photograph them at certain, in, um, certain periods. And so sometimes it's actually in the old photographs that you can really zoom in and see some very interesting details. So this is after she died. This photograph is from 1926. Um, and um, you can see that at this point... Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. At this point... Um, there were uh, flowers displayed in front of her painting because she'd only been dead just um, almost two years. Um, but what I want to show you is that, you know, as you can see it close up, she really did kind of create this altar-like installation. And one of the things that fascinated me when I first joined the museum is this item here. It's not easy to see in the photograph, but it's a huge, huge book. And um, so I'm a book expert, so you know, lots of people walk around the museum and the first thing they look at are the paintings. I look at the books in the cabinets, even though it's kind of hard to make out. And this one's just there in the most prominent position of the museum. And I said, oh, you know, what is that? And they said, oh, we haven't, I don't believe that's been opened in decades. Because Gardner didn't show it open, we don't show it open because it's part of her will to maintain her original installation. So I said, well, we have to rectify that. Let's open it. It takes three people to lift that book. It's extremely heavy. So we lifted it um, very carefully onto a table, and then I was able to examine it for several uh, weeks. And it's quite an incredible story. 
So it, there's no receipt for this book, and that's because um, it was a gift to Gardner from her brother-in-law, and he told her that it was rescued from a shipwreck of the Bay of Naples in southern Italy. It's quite a yarn. And so um, it's interesting because the book actually has definitely been damaged by water at some point. It has what we call cockled or wavy edges, and that's what happens when vellum or animal skin pages are, um, have come into contact with water, and it has water stains on the book in various places as well. So I imagined, as did previous um, scholars, that maybe that this was some kind of tale that a dealer had made up to um, kind of explain away the damage in a very kind of romantic way that would add to um, the history of this book. And over the centuries, um, sorry, in, in the last, you know, in the 20th century, people had thought that the book was Spanish, but my research showed actually that it's Italian from Naples. So maybe there's something to this story, and I would love to work with um, a, um, a naval historian to see if in the early 20th century there were any shipwrecks and whether there is any truth to the story, but I haven't been able to do that. So um, I managed to work that out through various mm, scholarly sources, printed works, um, because I could figure out that it was from a, a Dominican um, monastery in, in southern Italy, and then I kind of went along there. But something incredible happened at the same time. So six other volumes of this came on the art market um, for sale at Christie's in London, literally at the same time. And I actually worked there very briefly for a period. So my coll former colleagues there reached out to me and said, oh, we know you're interested in this book. These have just popped up. We couldn't believe it. And um, they had arrived at the um, Historical Society of New York, sorry, the Spanish Historical Society, Hispanic Society of New York, getting the title wrong. Um, and they had also realized that they weren't Spanish, so they decided to sell them. But the monastery in Italy where these come from had found out about it, and they were really upset. In fact, they tried to get the police involved to say that these were stolen goods. But um, it was clear that these had left Italy in the 19th century. So they had no case. So in the end, they settled out of court with Christie's and they purchased these items and they never went to auction at all. And um, so far, they haven't approached the gardener to ask perhaps to have this one back. I don't think the museum would give them. They can't because of the terms of the, of the, um, of the of gardener's will. Um, but essentially, this is now one of about 11 volumes that survive because the monastery already had a, a handful of their own as well. So it's quite incredible that these have all been kind of come back together and, and it's around the same period of time. It's quite a story. Um, but as you can see, it's a spectacular book inside. It's an antiphonal. Um, it's a common of saints. So it has um, the, the chants that would have been said on certain feast days throughout the liturgical year. And it's a shame um, because... Gardner didn't um, open it in her display. It's not usually on view to the public. When I worked at the museum, any excuse I could get, like, it's Christmas, let's take it out and show this, or it's the feast day of St. Stephen, let's take it out. I would always bring it out and show people, but I think now it barely sees um, the light of day. Um, I also invited a choir from Harvard to come and sing from the book, and we filmed them, and there's a video on YouTube of... Um, the professor and I talking about the history of the book and then these students singing from it. It was quite an experience because if you could imagine the courtyard of the museum, that music was wafting throughout the entire building. It was really something else. Just one more for you. So I'm going to end the pilgrimage with two items here. And then um, Professor Graham asked me to talk about the famous Gardner heist or the theft of artworks from the museum, and that's where I will end my, my um, talk. So um, in the Gothic room, there are two paintings displayed back to back. I kind of pointed it out to you. It's kind of hard to see um, side on, but Gardner was very fond of these kind of displays um, which were by windows because in her lifetime, the museum was largely lit by natural light. Um, so she would put her favorite works by windows at these kind of seated areas where in her day, but not now. Unfortunately, you could sit and contemplate them close up. And um, these two incredible paintings are back to back, and they're fairly similar in size, but quite different 
Um, so this one is by Simone Martini as well. We saw him in the early Italian room. And this is why um, Bernard Berenson said that the other painting was a bargain, because she bought that entire polyptic for £500, whereas this one, just a few years earlier, she bought for £400. And it's a tiny little thing like this. And this painting is important because it's a rare example of a, a, small, a small devotional painting with a predella. Usually you see these in altarpieces, large uh, monumental works. And predella, they are uh, kind of smaller panels that sometimes have narrative scenes and that relate to the uh, life of the saint that's been honoured. Um, and so it's very unusual for a, a painting of this size to have a, its own predella. And another reason why this is unusual is because it's not a fragment of a, of a larger work. It really is a complete um, small devotional piece. And we know this because this is its original frame and the whole thing is intact. It doesn't come apart in any pieces. The other work, which is by Giotto, um, an incredible um, painting. Again, this, this image doesn't really do it justice because it has this kind of otherworldly feel to it because of this incredible um, palette with this kind of really strange greens and the golds and the pastel colors. And this is a scene of the presentation in the temple. And it kind of, it really shows why Giotto became so um, famous for how he kind of imbued human emotions um, and feelings into paintings for the first time. And so you can see here that um, Mary and Joseph, and, and this is the um, infant Christ being held by the priest Simeon, who's recognized who he is. And that's why he's holding him with his arms covered and not with his bare hands. And then behind him, you have the prophetess Anna, who's also recognized who he is. She's holding a scroll. But this is the beauty of this piece, that Giotto shows Christ like any other child who wants his mum. So he turns back and leans towards his mother and is kind of leveraging himself by holding onto the beard of, of the priest. It's really quite extraordinary and just a, a mesmerizing um, painting. And so those two are back to back in the Gothic room and really treasures just there in a very kind of inconspicuous place and um, by the window in typical Gardner fashion. So here she is. <coughs> so I showed you this image very briefly earlier on and I returned to it because it's just so gorgeous. Oh, something's going on. Opposite that wall is this space and you'll notice a very, very sad sight which is empty frames. And the reason for that is, is in March um, 1990, actually the, the day after, kind of in the morning after St. Patrick's Day, so early in the morning on March 18th, two men came to the door of the museum dressed as Boston police officers. And they, they told the guards that they'd heard a disturbance, that they'd come to check it out. So the guards let them in. They were immediately um, tied up and um, put in the basement of the museum. And then these men then proceeded to walk around the museum. They were in the building for 81 minutes. Um, and they stole 13 works of art. Um, yeah. And this is what's known as the famous Gardner Heist. And that's because these works of art, which include works by um, Vermeer, Rembrandt, Degas, um, they now are valued somewhere, I mean, really they're priceless, but valued somewhere in the region of $500 million. Um, it's the largest um, heist um, of artworks that has remains unsolved. And this is an active case with the FBI, uh, working very closely with the head of security um, at the museum, who's a former police officer. There's currently a, a $10 million reward for these works, and there's a lot of interest in this case. When I worked at the museum, it's not something that we um, were really encouraged to talk about, but under the new um, director who came in about two years ago, they've really changed their uh, approach, and I think in a positive way. People are really fascinated about the heist. They come to the museum, quite frankly, just to see the empty frames. And it's funny because I would, you know, often give talks, uh, tours, and everyone's gawping at the frames, and I'm like, but they didn't take this amazing Rembrandt self-portrait that's just behind you. But you can't drag people's eyes away from it. It's just, it's really just quite incredible. And the reason why it looks like this, um, I should have said, is because the thieves, when they um, came to the Dutch room, which this space is, they cut the paintings from the frames. 
and presumably rolled them up and took them away with them. Um, it's, it's, it's really uh, quite extraordinary. And so, let's move now. So the museum now has taken a very different and new approach to it. They talk very openly about the theft. So this is actually a screenshot from their website where they talk about the reward, um, the story about the works themselves, how Gardner acquired them. And also you can take a virtual tour, which is really quite amazing and interactive. And it shows you where the works hung, um, uh, the old archival images of those galleries. So you can see them in situ, um, etc. It's really quite amazing. And I'm not surprised that they chose these two paintings of the two um, for the website, because these are the two most famous and arguably the most important of the works that were stolen. So you have um, Rembrandt's Storm on the Sea of Galilee. That's just a little detail from it. That's the only um, seascape of Rembrandt's um, that we know. And it also has a self-portrait of him in the painting. Um, and then the other work, this is um, Vermeer's The Concert. If you know anything about the um, artist Vermeer, you'll know that his oeuvre, his corpus of surviving works, are very small. There's only about 34 works of his that survive. So the fact that one of them is missing is actually is, is tragic. It's something that's really um, sad. Um, earlier on this year, um, the uh, Boston Globe magazine and WBUR, a radio station in the Boston area, they got together with the permission of the museum to do a podcast series. And, you know, I thought, oh, I, you know, I already know all there is to know about this case, but I listened to the entire series, and it's really quite remarkable because they have access to police documents and the museum's documents. They interviewed people. So the guards that I mentioned who were tied up and put in the basement, one of them agreed to be interviewed. They interviewed all kind of, uh, I don't know, a motley crew of shady criminals who at various points have been accused of being um, the thieves. It's really quite incredible. Unfortunately, there's no climax to the series because the paintings are still lost, but it's really quite interesting, and I highly recommend it if you want to know more about the case. It's, it's, it makes very interesting um, listening. And they got real privileged um, access to um, many of the materials. And again, I believe that museum is doing this because they're hoping that by now many of the people who would, would have been involved have now passed away. And that they're hoping that by spreading the word, and maybe that someone has these things in their home, they don't even realise what they are or where they came from. So the, the further they spread the word about these missing paintings, that they're hoping they'll be recovered. And also I believe that whoever recovers the paintings, even if they were the thieves or had some contact with the thieves originally, they will not be charged. They just want the paintings back and they will receive the, the reward, regardless of their role in the theft. It's really quite an incredible um, story. So that is the end of my uh, tour of the museum and I thank you for your patience. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie, as a just wonderful to see all those lovely views of the gardener and to get such an expert assessment of some of its riches. Time for questions. Yes. So museums are typically very careful about light. They don't want there to be too much light close to paintings because it might cause the paintings to deteriorate. But in the images, we saw that there were paintings that were close to windows. Did Isabella Stewart Gardner wa not worry too much about this? Thank you. That's a really interesting question. So in her daytime, in her lifetime, I think people weren't as aware of the, um, the um, impact of light on works of art. Um, so in more recent history, and certainly I think still to this day, there is, um, to enable to kind of keep this vision of her installation as it was, there are actually, um, scre there are, um, there are a system of kind of double shades, but also um, there are filters on the glass as well. And when the museum is closed, all the shades are down and they're actually kind of um, near blackout conditions. So 
when I worked there, I could walk through the galleries almost with my eyes closed. I would be fine navigating my way through the galleries in those conditions, but a lot of people would find it actually quite strange if you would have visitors like on a Monday when the museum used to be closed, that we would just shut down everything. Um, when I worked there, um, the, all of the bookcases in the long gallery had curtains on them, um, and also in other parts of the building, but they looked quite ugly, and she didn't have them in her lifetime. So in recent years, they've added, again, um, kind of light-sensitive filter to the glass. It's kind of like the same technology that you have in um, prescription sunglasses. So depending on the amount of light that hits it, they can, they're darker or they're lighter. So another thing that's happened is, um, because these works are on display at all times, which is not like a regular museum, where, you know, you would rotate things out, um, recently, they've actually started to um, replace some of the very light sensitive watercolours with facsimile. So actually, when you go to the garden now, um, the incredible collection of watercolours by John Singer Sargent, which are on the lower galleries, those are actually facsimiles and they're clearly marked as so. And that's a change that happened when I was there just a few years ago. So those had actually been on display for over, you know, almost 100 years. So that's a, it's an excellent question. And it's, it's a difficult museum because all of the works are on display at all times. So how do you preserve the work? And they actually have a very large conservation department. They have more conservators than they have curatorial staff there. And this incredibly um, talented team of people. And so the conservators, some of them are paintings conservators, some of them are object conservators, and some of them are paper conservators. They all have their special area of expertise and they approach the collection by media in terms of looking after it. Oh, what is the source of the gardener's wealth? Um, so two, source, two sources, so both from her husband's family and her own. So she was actually born in New York. Uh, she was from a wealthy uh, New York family. Um, she was sent um, to a boarding school in Paris, a Protestant boarding school. Her mother made sure of that. <laughs> And while she was there, she met an American girl and they became friends. And after they returned to the US, Gardner visited her in Boston and fell in love and married her brother, uh, Jack Gardner. Um, Jack Gardner's, um, they're a typical kind of Boston Brahmin family with old family, with money from different sources, um, from uh, shipping is one of the areas, they owned a lot of property as well. And her family were of a similar ilk. I believe they were textiles um, merchants originally, and that's where their wealth came from. But by that point, they, I mean, they literally had multiple properties around, in and around the city of Boston, so extremely wealthy family. The in interesting thing, though, and I'm glad you asked that question, because um, it reminds me that um, Gardner had two siblings, and, who, and they died um, pre-deceasing uh, pre their parents. When the parents died, they left their entire fortune to Gardner. And her husband said to her, that's your money to do what you want with. And that's what she used to start buying the um, artworks. So in the 1870s and 80s, she was buying on a more smaller scale. She comes into her inheritance in 1892, and the first thing she goes and do does is buys the Vermeer at auction in Paris. So, you know, <laughs> the whole money was, um, the whole museum was built on her um, inheritance, and that might be one of the reasons why she called it after herself and not after herself and her husband. very gloomy with the storm out. I remember walking through it and it was barely lighted in that museum. And my thought was that, I think, is it possible that the very same types of light fixtures are used as, as in the day? So Isabella Stewart Gardner wanted the museum to be left exactly as it was in her own day. My wife and I visited it.